Welcome to the Miniatures Paintbrush. Today we're going to talk about painting up this Reaper Miniatures carry-on worm. Hello and welcome back. Time to prime this miniature up with some Rust-Oleum. And that's the Camouflage 2X cover. I really like these paints, they're ultra flat. And I'm gonna start up with some Sienna, dark Sienna there, um, extra opaque. And I'm gonna push it through the airbrush. Now you may be asking yourself, well, I thought Reaper Bones didn't need any primer. And according to Reaper, you'd be correct. But I am just comfortable laying down some primer. One, two, I do want a sort of undercoat before I begin. So whether it's paint or primer, it doesn't matter because the primer I'm using here is colored to what I'm going for as far as the effects concerned. I kind of want a green tone for the belly, so I kind of want to just go for it. Now, in essence, I didn't zenithal highlight here like I normally do a miniature I wanted to change things up a bit and really just include my highlights with an airbrush and show you how that's done as well so with this Sienna I am using extra opaque game color now it is not designed for an airbrush to go through an airbrush so if you're going to use these colors as well as model colors it's fine to use through an airbrush, just make sure you have some thinning medium. Now, if you don't know what thinning medium is, I did have a video up, uh, and I'll put a link right here above, so you can get it right now. Okay, so once you've thinned the paint down appropriately, and it does take a little while with the airbrush to find out what appropriately is. People say to a milky consistency, but that leaves a lot of room for, you know, interpretation. <laughs> okay, so um, it's up to you. What I do is I'll just put usually three drops of water, one drop of medium uh, in that cup there and uh, one to two drops of paint, depending how thick the paint is. I'll mix that up, I'll spray it through, and as I'm spraying it, there's a little nozzle on the back of your airbrush. You can actually twist it to the how much flow comes out. And when I'm comfortable with the flow, I can't go surpass that, I use it that way. Now some people raw dog it, and that means you don't use the back part where, I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't use the back part. I guess if you just want to be quick about it, but mm, I don't know. I like to use the rules. Now I'm going to come up with a lighter brown. Uh, I believe that's terracotta. Not really exactly sure, but I did use a lighter brown. You can use any lighter brown for this. And what I'm doing is adding the highlights. It's a sort of a zenithal kind of priming, but just using the actual colors instead of just using primer, I'm actually using the paint. So what it does is just lightens up the top pieces of that carapace right there in the back. And now I'm gonna hit Earth, and I'm gonna lighten it up even more so. And this part, I'm just catching the little tips, and I'm going a little, just, just on the top, just to create some hot spots of that brown. Brown, for me, is a little tricky to get hot spots on, only because you just have to go lighter brown, lighter brown. I guess you can go up to a tan, but I, you have to be careful. You don't want to, like, make it read as white. So I just hit the top right there, and I just wanted it to be a little bit different from the rest because it has those kind of eyes there. And uh, just a little bit on the folds, just where the light is catching it. And... This is creating a transition, a very, very subtle transition, transition between the colors. And that's kind of what you want to do. You want to have a gradient shift in color instead of just a dramatic shift in color. Uh, next up is the mouth. And for the mouth, I used this beastly kind of brown. And it was actually kind, quite orange. <laughs> 
which I did like. You know, I really like that effect. That kind of beastly kind of brown uh, through the airbrush came out pretty well. Uh, although, as far as you know, gums are concerned, orange wasn't the way I want to go. Although those two brown orange colors are very, 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 very uh, light on the eyes. In other words, it looks looks good. I like the color combination right there. So what I decided to do is later on, I'm going to put some details on with that color to have that color play uh, in mind. But uh, I also uh, use some pink. But right now, I want to create the shadows. Since I didn't zenithal highlight, uh, I wanted to darken in the shadows. And I do so with a little bit of layers uh, through the airbrush of that Agrax Earth Shade. That's right. People say don't use Agrax Earth Shade through an airbrush. Like it doesn't mean anything. But I find it works really well. So I don't know what those people are talking about. All right. So this time I'm going to try some FW Ink Magenta. And just throwing that in as a lighter color, and it, I found out that using it this way, I don't know what I did to it, but I don't know, maybe I thinned it out too much. I, I'm, I wasn't sure, but it wasn't working well. So I figured this sucker needs a little bit of paint included into the magenta to make give it that pinkish color for the gums, and that's what I was going for there. Uh, trying to build up the transition with just the FW inks didn't work for me. Again, I think I over diluted it or I did something to it. I'm not exactly sure where it went wrong, but I over diluted it and it just didn't want to stick to the miniature. And sometimes when you over dilute it and you put too much pressure in and you don't have the dial setting right onto the airbrush, you're going to run into problems. Airbrush, an airbrush using an airbrush is great. I mean, really is great, but it's temperamental in my opinion, where you have to adjust some dials, you have to get it just right, you gotta get the paint mixture just right, and when you get that sweet spot, man, you can go on for days. So here it is with just the magenta, and I didn't like the way it looks, so I mixed it in with some Lust Pink from Minotaur, and I wanted to see where this laid, led me. Again, when I'm painting miniatures, um, I'm not doing another carry-on worm in the background and having you, you know, okay, I learned how to do the carry-on worm. Now I'm going to do a second one for the audience. Nope, this is my first one. So any kind of experimentation I do, I do it live, so to speak. I mean, it's pre-recorded, but at the same time, I only do it once. So if I get it wrong, oh, well, you know. Um, then again, if I get it wrong, I show you how to correct it too. So that's how I just do it. Now I'm looking at this with the lust pink and the magenta, and I'm like, hmm, it looks like he ate a lot of cotton candy, right? Yeah, I'm not too happy about that. Here I thought I ruined it, but um, hey, you know what? That added to another layer on which I'm going to add it back on. So there you go. Just want to hit it again with that little bit of orange just at the center and having that cotton candy pink show through dully uh, through a very, very thin translucent coat and getting somewhere in between is where you want it to be. So there it is. You got that, that beastly brown going into the pink just to get it through and having a good in between. Rawr. You may notice that I, I look at the miniature a lot and I do that while I'm painting it because, you know, sometimes when you're looking at it straight, you know, you're just looking at it and you're seeing what's available from one angle. So I'm constantly moving the miniature around to get a, a better angle, different perceptions, looking at the light, looking how it's hitting. So I'm constantly moving that miniature around. And I recommend you do that when you're painting miniatures. Constantly flip it back and forth just to see, take another look, put it away, put it further away from you, closer up. Sometimes you're too close and you don't see the entire picture of how the miniature is going to look. Sometimes you're too far away and you're really missing out a lot of the details. So constantly shifting it back and forth gives you a greater perspective. Okay, next up what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, start base coating the teeth. And when I base coat the teeth, what I'm using is Stynol Res, a white Stynol Res primer that I thinned down just a bit and put some on my wet palette. Uh, in order to build up some layers and what you want to do is you if you want to paint something 
white-ish or bonish white. I put a layer of white on it so this way I can put on the bonish white on top of that. And the reason is because if you're just trying to paint white over a dark surface, it'll take so many coats that it'll just waste time. This way you put one to two coats of this primer and once you prime the area and get it to that white you already have a great base now you can take this a step further and add some shadows to it at this stage and then with a very very glazed medium glaze on the bone white onto the uh, second layer and it'll give it that shadowy coming through shadows uh, through the white layered of the bone white that you're going to add on later on. But I decided not to do that. I'm going to create a gradient using browns when it comes to the teeth here. So I started off with the white primer right there. So as I'm painting the white primer on here, I do want to tell you just a little bit about a carry-on worm. Now, I found a lot of information on the web about uh, carry-on worms. Um, and I wanted to share some of that with you. So, so allow me to share some of that information with you. Carry-on worms actually came out uh, in D&D &D a very, 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 very long time ago. In fact, it was in the 1970s. Carrion Wars was one of the first monsters that appeared uh, in Greyhawks uh, in 1975. Wow, this is an old sucker right here. Oh, this is a representation of a carrion worm. According to D&D, uh, carrion worms actually have tentacles that come out, aside from just real big old teeth. Uh, carry-on, well, actually they call it carry-on crawlers. Carry-on crawlers actually have small teeth that grind up things and not these large, big husks. Which is interesting that this guy has been around for quite some time. All right, time for some parasite brown. That's what it was to get that nice orange. And what I'm going to do is hold my wrist and I'm going to attempt uh, to paint certain areas of the miniatures, these eyes here, if you call them eyes, if you want to, and just exerting brush control. How do you develop brush control? People have asked me. Well, brush control, it's not easy to do, but it's, it's kind of easy to practice, which is you brace your arm, your hand, you brace yourself, you brace your wrist and you limit and restrict your motions. And then from that place, what you can do is use small little motions like I'm doing right now, steadily because everything is braced, in order to paint the miniature however it is that you deem fit. What I'm starting with these eyes, I'm starting at the tips of the eyes and slowly working my way down to the base. And you need to be careful here at this step. And in this step, the reason why you need to be careful is because one little misstep and you're going to get that orange onto that carapace. And that won't look right. So, use very little paint and slowly build up the color around the eye, starting from the tip of the eye, which is the one that's furthest out from the skin, and work your way slowly to the sides of it, just barely touching it, in order to get close to the edge without touching it. Be very careful here, and you know, exercise your caution, but and the good thing is, is that there are many eyes here. Now, some people may say, that's a bad thing. I mean, if you just have paint one eye, you get it done, and you get it over with, and then, yeah, you can breathe again. But this way, I get more practice, and if I get more practice, I get better at it. So the more eyes, the better, because the better I get, the more brush control I get. So that's an easy way to study brush control. So as I'm painting the eyes, and continue painting the eyes, and you can see what I'm doing here, let's talk a little bit more about the carry-on crawler, what this is based on. The carry-on crawler was one of the earliest creatures introduced in the D&D game. In all editions of the game, carry-on crawlers 
are said to live underground. But some would go to the surface for food. They are akin in appearance and three to four foot long, like a centipede. The carrion crawler possesses eight long tentacles protruding from the sides of the head, which allow it to stun its prey. The creature eats carrion, but it is known to kill live prey as well. Carrion crawlers are neutral in alignment. There are carrion crawlers in other mediums as well, aside from just D&D. Of course, there's the D&D games, Baldur's Gate, Part 1 and Part 2, Icewind Dale. There's also a creature like this in Return of the Temple Elemental. Now, D&D is not the only place where this is, uh, where it appears, where carrion crawlers appear. Carrion worm, uh, I've looked up, is also in World of Warcraft. That's right, World of Warcraft. And uh, it, it appears as an elite dungeon uh, crawler, or enemy, in a Shadow Moon burial grounds, in the Altar of the Shadow. I don't know exactly where that is. And I used to play WoW too. So, I mean, it's interesting that it's actually in other games. And just to see how much influence that D&D has on the gaming genre. Not only does it appear in World of Warcraft, but it also appears in Final Fantasy IX. Carry on worms. So, according to fandom, which is where I'm getting this from, the carrion worm is an insect enemy from Final Fantasy IX that can be found in Claria. They are moderately dangerous and can be inflict trouble status on the party member, which is trouble juice. Trouble juice. You know, trouble juice. It also has Bazaria and Aqua Breath as well. This can inflict damage to the entire party, so be careful with it. The resistance of fire. So that that's amazing how DD actually affects other video games. Okay, so I'm done with the eyes, but I love this color, and that carapace is dull as all get out. So what do you do in that situation? Here, what I do is just paint globs. What I was thinking of and what inspired me is I didn't know where to go with this. I was just going to do polka dots and I was just putting paint on a miniature and I could have ruined it. But, you know, I pulled a Bob Ross and I, you know, make a happy little mistake and turn it into something else, right? Not really a mistake. I just didn't know where I was going with this. What it turned out going with this is not following a pattern. Now, it's very important that if you're going to freehand like this, that you do not follow a specific linear pattern. And the reason why you don't follow a pattern is because the brain wants to complete a pattern. It'll notice even if something is just a tiny bit off. So... If you create an exact pattern, a symmetrical pattern, then you are a slave to that. And, and the chances for error are huge. And the smaller the miniature, the more chances for error, because a small slight hair off would turn it to a completely different location if that miniature was actually in one-to-one -one scale. So staying asymmetrical is the way to go. So what I'm doing is just putting little polka dots of that nice, that nice other color, that nice orange type color, uh, just putting those polka dots in because I love the way that these colors mix. Ever since I did the mouth in that color, um, this parasite brown, I, I just love those two combinations. It looks great. So I started off with little polka dots and I'm like, mmm, itsy bitsy, teeny weeny. Parasite brown polka dot bikini didn't work for me, but this was a starting point. That's right. 
a starting point. Now you could do little polka dots, and that doesn't work. That works for me. That may work for you, but it didn't work for me, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, you know, you can do it differently. You can outline it uh, as well, which I learned that I needed to do as well. But what I was going for as I kept on painting this, there is a reference here in this cartoon that I saw, a uh, Naruto. And one of the people actually had clouds on their cape or something they were wearing. And I thought that was kind of neat. So, I mean, this sort of resembles that, not really. Uh, just putting dots next to dots, just to expand the dots, and that's how it came out inadvertently. So as I'm expanding, I'm just touching the paint onto the miniature, just touching the paint, expanding the area of the dot, seeing where it leads me. And I really like the effect because it really looked like something a little different. It was fun. It was fun to add those little effects to it. And it's not realistic. It's more cartoonish, but that's okay for me. So I can do that style, and I enjoy that style as well as doing something realistic. Or maybe combining the both and meeting it halfway is the way to do this. So just adding some, some variation to that carapace really changes it up. It really makes it from dull to interesting. It gives it that visual interest that you need when you come to painting a miniature. And why would you need visual interest? Because you don't want somebody to look at your miniature and get bored and keep going. You put all this work and effort into it. Make it look as interesting as possible. So people will keep looking at it in awe and wonder. And for every second that you sp they spend in awe and wonder, you spend all smitten with this nice little smug look on your face like, mm-hmm. Yo, I did that all proud of your work. <laughs> hey, that makes me happy <laughs> all the time. That somebody actually likes my work makes me ecstatic. Because when I look at my works, I, I tend to just look at the mistakes, seeing what I can improve, constantly pushing myself. So looking at my own work, I'm my worst critic, definitely. But other people, they seem to really like it. And, and if you're watching this, then you must like it. And I really do appreciate you and thank you for watching. All right, so now we have these patterns, these little globs that I kind of put on there. But what next? That wasn't good enough for me. So I'm going to wash out my little brush here and see what I can do to just to brighten up the mood or brighten up the uh, the pattern. Now I tried on this one using Floyd um, and some black to outline one of these features that I created on the carapace. Now usually when it comes to this, I usually use a micron pen, which is very easy. But this time I really wanted to practice my brush control when it comes to outlining things. The pen has a super fine tip. That's true. The pen, using a micron pen, actually has that very hard tip as well, and you can actually gouge the paint out, so you need to be careful. Brushes are a lot softer, softer and more forgiving. So, when you're actually um, painting it up, it actually is more conforming to what you're painting. So I wanted to try that. I wanted to definitely try that. Something new again for me. Uh, outlining, just using a paintbrush instead of using anything else. And I have to admit, I was, I was a bit nervous. <laughs> I cannot tell a lie. I was a bit nervous while doing this. But you know what? Whenever you're painting, you need to push yourself to that next level. You need to be able to... to take some risks. And since this is a Reaper Bones, I wasn't all that scared. Yes, I was afraid of messing up the entire paint job, but at the same time, even if I did mess up a little bit, which I do later on actually, I can always go back with that Parasite Brown and fill in the areas that I didn't, you know, that I did all right with. Or I can take the other browns if I went over too far and be able to fill that in. So either way, one way or the other, I could always fix my mistakes and it would be fine. So my advice to you is go for it. I mean, you can't gain any, any more skill if you don't try.
and you need to try new things. I'm always pushing myself to try new things and I'm leading by example. So this is new for me and actually I love the way it came out. Like I really think it's a lot of fun. So let's get back to Carry On Worms. In the latest edition of D&D, the Carry On Crawler is said to scour putrid flesh from the carcasses and gobble up slimy bones that remain. They aggressively attack any creature that trespasses on their territory or disturbs their feasting. Carry on crawlers follow the scent of death to its food, but it prefers not to compete with other scavengers. These foul creatures thus hunker down in territories where death is plentiful, and other carry on eaters have limited mobility. Caves, sewers, dungeons, and forest marshes are their favorite layers, but carry-on crawlers also are drawn to battlefields and cemeteries. The carry-on crawler roams on the hunt, its tentacles probing the air for the scent of blood or decay. In tunnels or ruins, carry-on crawlers scurry across the ceiling as they move towards their food. This way, to avoid contact with oozes and other dangerous inhabitants of the darkness. Even as they surprise potential meals that don't think to look up. What, whether the subterranean darkness or while hunting at night, light signals a potential meal. A carry-on crawler might follow a light source from a distance for hours, hoping to pick up the scent of blood. Despite their great size, carry-on crawlers can also easily set up ambushes while waiting around blind corners for prey to come at them. When facing potential prey or intruders, a carry-on crawler lets its poison do the work. Once a victim goes rigid with paralysis, the carry-on crawler wraps it with its tentacles and drags it away to the high ledge or isolated passageway where it can be killed safely. The monster then resumes patrolling the territory while waiting for its meal to ripen. How gross is that? Dude, you are gross. So carry-on crawlers rely on smell. This is a good idea for me not to paint in eyes because they rely on smell. Carry-on crawlers can climb difficult surfaces, including upside-down ceilings. Carry-on crawlers make two attacks, one with its tentacles and one with a bite. And I can be sure that that bite right there, it would be pretty nasty. Okay. So let's get back to what I'm doing here. And what I'm doing here is adding some more variation to the carapace. Although the parasite brown splotches with the outlines black seems fun and whimsical, I felt like there wasn't enough detail going on in the back of that carapace. So what I did was I added little freckles. One, two, and three in a triad. So I was going for triple little 
freckles, black freckles going through. And it really worked well. It really added more details to the miniature. And it was so easy to do. You don't really need to get fancy to add some fun detail to your models. Just a couple of dots, a triad of dots will work just fine. And it was a lot of fun just to add these on because the skill level needed to add some dots onto this was next to nothing. So it was really easy to do and a lot of fun. These carry on worms or crawlers, they have poison damage. So when it comes to poison damage, they'll just attack. And it's interesting, it's interesting that they say that uh, these carry on crawlers, that they, they're not unusual to cemeteries because within the graveyard expansion pack that this came in, there's the reason why it came into that expansion pack because carry on crawlers are no stranger to cemeteries and battlefields according to them. Okay, next up, just looking at where the miniature could be tidied up. And I wanted to tidy up with that darker brown, the little edges of his little hands. So in order to do that, I took a mid-tone and just dotted little areas I saw I got a little overbrush on when it came to the white primer. And I'm going around the miniature, just tidying up wherever I possibly can. This is a pretty diluted brown, but at the same time, there is coverage there because it's extra opaque. So it's looking good. Oddly enough, this black was diluted very little, but it did have a sheen to it in the light. Interesting. All right, tie some bow and white. This time what I'm going to do is the next phase of painting the teeth and its little claws. And that is to be able to point some bone white onto the teeth. Now, the reason why you don't go straight white with the teeth is because when you go straight white with anything, I never paint anything straight white, because when you go straight white with anything, you can never highlight white. White is the highest color that you can get. So it's always an off-white that I go for. Hence this yellow, warm, uh, bone white. And I do like that warm colors because the orange is warm, the brown is warm colors. The green is so muted, it's not as cold. It's creating that contrast, though. And then you have that warm teeth to match it. So it just, it to me, it's pleasing to the eyes to have all these warm colors because it seems like everything goes together. It takes some time to paint uh, white in itself, so why not prime it white so this way this coat and this process could be easy. Okay, what I did here is I did a little bit of overbrush, and then I quickly diluted the brush and then just completely went over the brush and used, dried off the brush afterwards, and then soaked up the excess water to take any paint out of there. And whenever you're making a mistake that you overbrush, if you can catch it on time really quickly, what you do is you just put some water on, dilute it, and then take the wipe that off, and then take the brush again and soak up some of that excess. Okay, so... Next up, I'm using some brush control here. The same technique that I used for the eyes, I'm going to replicate on the teeth. That is that I'm holding that I'm holding down the miniature and when I really need to get really close into details, I will brace my arm against my body and then lean it on the table and then just limit the amount of movement that I do. Now, if I really wanted to get into a small area, and these teeth are well, quite large compared to the eyeballs that I did before, if you call them eyes, then what I did was is that I didn't need to brace my wrist when painting them. So it was a little easier to paint up the teeth than it was the eyes. But at the same case, you're 
always exhibiting an amount of brush control. And it, it really is a super important skill to have when painting miniatures because when you need it, if it's there, then it will come out amazing. So if you need it, I would say when you need it, when you need it and you have this skill, it'll be amazing that you could pull it off. And those things are really, really important, especially when doing so many small little details on a small surface. Every little bit, every little overbrush shows immensely. And it just brings down the quality of your miniature. So if you do not want to bring down the quality of your miniature and really have a, a, a flowing paint job where one material, like the bone material right there, and the gums material, uh, they don't interact very well. In other words, there's a clear line separating one from the other, and that's why it gives it that kind of texture. Speaking of texture, with the gums, I wanted to add a little more gloss to it. So there are two ways in which you can add a lot of gloss to a certain area or a sheen to an area. One, when it comes to these miniatures, is that you thin down the paint exorbitantly with just water and no medium. When you thin down the paint exorbitantly with water and no medium, it reacts in a funny way. Since these, Vallejo, are not gel-based paints, unlike war colors and, and fantasy games like from Skills Color, they have gel medium, so you can thin them down with water till the cows come home and they're fine. They do not get glossy. But when it comes to these paints, they get glossy. That's one of the things that they do. Now you can use this to your advantage because if you ever wanted like the gums to be a little glossy because they're wet, they're gums, then you could just thin it down. When it comes to the teeth though, I use thinner medium in order to get it to flow and it not be glossy because I mean, you have some pearly whites, but I didn't want these to shine. In fact, I wanted to discolor them as much as possible, creating a gradient. Because if you look at this miniature, the one thing that you are got to really stare at, sure, you are got to look at the carapace, you are got to look at the little funky little designs, you are got to look at the underbelly, that's going to bring your attention. The, the mouth area is the centerpiece. It's... It's, it's always, look at how protruding those teeth are. You've got to notice them. So I wanted to create a smooth gradient with those teeth. And I didn't want to actually paint eyeballs on the eyes for the simple reason is that according to, according to the lore here, it says that they can't really see. So... There you go. Why is the point of having eyes if they're glassed over? I guess I can do glassed over eyes. But you know what? I wasn't getting that detail. This, all in all, for me is what I call a speed paint. For me, it's what I call a quick paint. It's because I'm painting it quickly. <laughs> I'm not going all the way out and, and trying to make it a competition like model. But at the same time, I have a standard in which I paint to, for me, that some people consider it above their standard. Some people consider it below their standard. But I wanted to do like a tabletop plus kind of model, like something that, no, it's not going to win any competitions, but dang, is it really going to look great on a table. I mean, great on a table, like impressive people from other tables in the gaming store will come to your, to your game just to see your miniatures and how cool they look. That kind of cool. That's what I was going for right there. So I guess tabletop plus ultra cool. I don't know what grade you would call that. So... That's the level of the miniature I'm always trying to push towards. And I'm always trying to get even better and possibly being able to speed paint a competition-like model. And that it, those terms do not go together. When you're painting for competition, when you think you're over and you say, okay, I'm done, I can put down the brush, go back and keep going and keep going and, and go 
10 more days. Every time you think you're done, go 10 more days. <laughs> Keep pushing yourself. Add more details. Every cook, every cranny, every shadow, because the, everything like that gets paid attention to in competition. So you can you can just drive yourself nuts and batty in order getting to get every single detail and and getting it and pushing paint to the point that the blends are absolutely perfect from the shadow in every single shadow everywhere across the miniature and getting the highlights getting those blends perfect that they're subtle but at the same time they show off texture and at the same time they show off just the right amount of highlight to pop the area but without overstating it 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 is an art some people ask well is miniature painting an art i say yes it is an art absolutely because you still have to make the gradients no you're not creating things but you can do some freehand and it's aesthetically beautiful Granted that when a piece is sculpted, it looks aesthetically beautiful by itself in white, but even more so when it's painted. Plus, it's a lot of fun to paint miniatures, I think, because it's really bringing those miniatures to life. So, speaking about bringing miniatures to life, here I am bringing this uh, Carry On Worms arms to life trying to get rid of all that stark white and making it into that bone white. Again, that bone white against that brown is it's just beautiful. I really like it. I really love that transition. I like the yellow of it. I love it. I love it. Oh my goodness, that's scary. Alrighty, dip into that wet palette, guys. If you don't have a wet palette, you really need to get one. You just make one, just some parchment paper uh, and underneath the parchment paper. And don't use wax paper. Wax paper is not porous. In other words, the water won't seep up through it. Use parchment paper where the water will seep up through it and keep the paint wet for an extended period of time. And when you do that, what you're doing is essentially uh, being able to use the same exact paints that you used when you first painted an area. So let's say you paint something, the next day you come and take a look and you're like, oh, I missed the spot. Well, if you try to take brand new paint and paint that exact same spot, well, you have to remember just how diluted the paint was when you first put it down onto the palette and diluted it. So whatever ratio you use, you need to use the same ratio. Also, you need to consider if the paint was out or not. If the paint was out, then it may be a little thicker. Then you have to consider the temperature of the paint. If the paint is warmer, it tends to be more fluid than it does uh, if it's cold. Then you have to determine the exact amount of that drop for the dropper, because you can take a drop from a dropper bottle, cut it in half, and just post it onto your your palette, whatever it is. So you have to be absolutely precise with these things. And sometimes you can't be precise with those things because it's just almost impossible to measure. It's very difficult to say the least. So what a wet palette does is it gives you that exact ratio, that exact color back again. It, you can use it a day later, a week later. It's still there and it's still nice and moist for you to do. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm just taking some of that mid-tone and going between the teeth, getting voiding out that pink, leaving that pinkish, orangish uh, color, that parasite brown with that lust pink and the magenta, and just separating it from the gum line right there. Because this beast, in my opinion, has no gum line, really. What it has, it's the skin, and that skin, those teeth are actually protruding out of the skin. And the only reason why its pinkish uh, underside is exposed is because it's about to feed. So that's the only exposure point. So those teeth, in my opinion, will stay out or will curl directly in. I don't know. <laughs> Ew. Ew. I think they're too big to stay out. I think he just walks up like his mouth open like, arr, arr. how you doing? My name is Carry On Worm. Can you imagine this thing talking? 
It's, it doesn't have, have a tongue, so I have no idea how it would speak. I don't think it would speak then. So just taking a mid-tone and going over, just a light glaze over, touching the little areas, bringing that brown into the mix, uh, separating that brown from the other areas, from the lips, making sure that you don't overbrush it and you leave some of that lip area exposed so it caves that, that transition. You know exactly the line where one thing transitions to the next one, when one material transitions to the next material. So going from gum material to going from you know outer skin material. Okay, time for some Seraphon Sepia. And what we're going to do is we're going to just darken up the mouth a little bit, make it dirty. That's a dirty mouth. Dirty mouth. Carry on wording dirty mouth. That's what you have. <laughs> so, that's a dirty mouth. So what I'm doing is just adding some of this wash into the mix. Just trying to create a hole because if you look back in his mouth, it's just as pink as the top gums. So there's no hole for it to go to a digestive, digestive tract. Also, with the Seraphon Sepia, I like to use it to create a brownish transition at the base of the teeth or the base of bones and horns. I do similar techniques like that. Although, I might use some Agrax Earthshade with that as well. So all I'm doing is lightly going over the base of all the teeth. It really creates a nice effect. Instead of just being stark white or stark bone color, you have a transition, a gradient, something that's going into something that gives visual interest to the viewer. Again, like I said before, you want to create visual interest because that'll keep people looking at your models. Now, if you do enter a contest, you want to also keep people looking at your models because the more attention it receives, well, the more attention it receives. And if it receives all the attention, then you have won the contest. You have won the award. Good job. So keep that in mind when it comes to when it comes to adding all these details and all these visual interests, keep that in mind because it's really super important for you as a painter to keep pushing yourself and to keep adding different visual interest aspects and start thinking along the lines of creating visual interest, especially on areas where there's just nothing there. You want to avoid large spaces where there's just nothing there because there's no visual interest. These are little canvases for you to go out there and create some free hands. They're just begging for it, really. Because here you have nothing, and now the sculptor isn't telling you, well, this is a foot, so you have to paint it foot color, and the, he wears these kind of shoes, so you have to paint the shoes and the buckles and everything else. The, the actual sculptor is telling you what to paint. But in this instance, when you have a free, large, open area on a miniature, now it's up to you to create something and to create that visual interest. So I don't get saddened or challenged, I guess. I don't know. I don't get sad or, or frustrated when I have a large open area that I have to do some freehand to it. No. Quite the contrary, when I have to do some freehand, I get excited. I get excited because here I am pushing myself to that next level. And I do want to get to that next level of painting. And I'm sure all of you, if you're watching this channel, also want to improve as painters. That if you're watching this channel, that you really want to push yourself as a painter to get better, to have really awesome miniatures. Now you can use the miniatures for your campaigns or your games or war gamings or whatever it is you're gonna use it. Or even if it just stays in a, a locked case, that's a glass case that other people can look and admire. Any way you want to, you want hecka cool looking miniatures. And if you want hecka cool looking miniatures, then you're gonna to have to push yourself beyond your comfort zone. And a lot of artists say that, push yourself beyond the comfort zone. And what that means is, if you are really good at doing something, okay, that's nice, move on. 
Okay, next thing you become really good at after painting for, for a very long time and getting better at whatever it is that you learned how to do. Okay, that's nice. Move on. And you keep on doing that. And you keep on searching for different things you haven't tried, like non-metallic metal, true metallic metal, non-metallic silver and gold, and all kinds of shades, skin tones. Skin tones have always been intimidating for me, and recently I just painted something up that was that received a lot of accolades on social media, which that video is coming up later on. So, skin tones were something I was completely afraid of. Now, metallic metal, something I'm completely afraid of, I was completely afraid of when it comes to just adding details. And I've gotten better and better and better with that. Now, I might do, I don't know, I do have a uh, Stormcast Eternal Army that I, I want to get painted up. But doing all of them now, metallic metal, seems a bit much. So, what I might do, I don't know, if I, I, maybe a blue metal or, you know, I don't know. Green metal? I don't know. Emerald metal? I haven't decided just yet. Something that matches with a gold accent, because I would like to put some gold accents in there uh, as well, just to paint them up easily. Now you may be asking yourself, Self, why don't you play true metallic metal? Well, that's something I want to do too. So that might be an avenue that I explore as well. True metallic metal with the non-metallic metal highlights uh, and shadows. So see how that works out. Um, some people just play paint non uh, true metallic metal like gold, put some serapon sepia, and call it a day. Now, I can tell you this right now. I am not a wash and done kind of guy. I am not here to uh, speed paint to the point where I'm batch painting because I don't like batch painting. I don't like batch painting because I keep on getting better every miniature I paint one at a time until I can pour all the techniques that I learned into one miniature. So I'm saving things like the Riptide suit, like the Night Titan, like Nagash, and big projects like that. I'm saving them for when I get comfortable enough with enough techniques, enough of these things that I'm pushing myself to the next level. And once I get comfortable to that, then then I'll take on a big project and see how it is. I did take on the um, Mortis engine. And boy, oh boy, it's like painting 15 miniatures. Because all the skeletons are individual and they're, they're, they're hoisting up the cart. And I didn't want to paint them as if they were just one color and that's it. I wanted to paint them each individually, every skull every bony bit as a bony bit instead of it being translucent. And in doing that, I challenged myself to be able to yeah, push myself to that next level. And it took, it was, it was painful. <laughs> it was, after a while, it started becoming painful. And I was really happy with the results, but it took so long. Now, what I want to do is be able to paint something of that size in just a quicker time. Uh, I am a slow learner, but once I do learn, I'm a quick applier. In other words, once I have it in my memory, it's locked in for quite some time. So, now all I'm doing is darkening up the shadow and trying to increase that shadow underneath the belly. I just thought it needed it personally, just really diluted that uh, water and just dragging it across. I do realize if you put too much water onto this, you might start taking off paint, so be very careful with that. What a fun miniature to paint, I have to say. Although, I also have to say that um, it looks a little like a dung monster. I know, I know. I put it up on social media. And they like, ooh, look at the little dung monster with teeth. How terrifying is that? Can you, I, I can't imagine that. I cannot imagine that. That's just creepy beyond my comprehension. Yeah. <laughs> so 
So here I am on this, ugh. Ah, I can't get it out of my head. Here I am just pushing up some extra Ag Agrax Earthshade onto the miniature to create those shadows. And then I go on to the next step. Clean out your brush, going on to this bone white again, and just hitting the, the highest, highest details with this. Mixing it up. Again, on that wet palette, a little bit of Tupperware, a little bit of paper towel, and just top it all off with parchment paper, and you got it. Just hitting the tips of that, brightening up those teeth where the sun would hit it, and that's it. And that's what you want to do. You kind of want to end on a highlight. You don't want to end any miniature at the just shade and you're done. Because it, it just never works out right. I mean, you have very little control when you come to the shading. So if you're shading, you're done. Well, I don't know. I, I just can't do it. I would have to definitely put in the highlight and have the highlight be the last coat. So it's on top. It's shining brightly. And there you go. So what I would do is um, primer, base coat, create a gradient, and then finally go in with a highlight after you wash it down. And there you go. Those are those gnarly teeth. Yeah, bruh, they're gnarly. Oh, let's not forget the little hands. Kind of want that too. Uh, because they're matching the teeth. Basically, those hand material, what I was going for was creating like little teeth that are coming out the side of the miniature. There you go. So it's all bone. It's all bone. It's creepy that something like this can pop out of the graveyard like that. Yeah. I would not like to be, well, maybe I do want to be the D&D the &D group that meets this guy. Oh, shake your thing up, buddy. <laughs> all right now it's all about that base now time for some Steinal res i'm gonna do the base up now i did pre-do this base let's talk about it i use the same techniques sort of of what i used for the dust king and that is that i use that uh, modeling paste and just like mousse put a little dab on it and go straight up in order to make little peaks but I also added in just some road gravel and some construction sand and some little rocks that I found. And I just kind of put it all together. I was thinking about putting a skull on there, but then I thought against it. After all, it's a carry-on worm and not a death scythe or anything like that. So, painting the rocks were important. The way you look at the miniature right now, it just looks like, you know, rocks are protruding out of mud, but, and the rocks themselves are muddy as well. And I didn't wanna go for that look. I want it to be more than just a big old mud pile. So in order to change it up, uh, you have to add some kind of color variation into that base. But at the same time, I did not want, did not want the base to take over the miniature, which in my opinion could have easily be done for the simple reason it, is that it's brown. So the base is brown and the carry on worm is brown and it's coming out of the base. So one point, you not, may not know where one begins and one ends, but at the same point, you don't want the base to be so colorful that this brown worm gets overshadowed by the base. Because then the visual interest happens on the base level and not on the miniature level. And you're painting miniatures. If you wanted to just paint bases, then maybe, I don't know, terrain is your thing, which is cool, because that's just one of the parts of the hobby, see? The hobby has terrain, building, and painting. The hobby has miniature building and painting. And the hobby has playing and strategizing and you know, playing using the miniatures in games. So this is all parts of the hobby. So if you're a terrain building, 
builder, then my respect is to you. See, I'm a little bit of everything. I like to pl paint. I enjoy playing sometimes. Um, it's very rare. And I love, love, love to paint. Paint up uh, and make terrain. I enjoy that. That's what we do here at the Miniatures Paintbrush. And that's how we do. So just like the teeth, you're going to want a nice opaque um, base coat with the primer. And that opaque, that opaque base coat with the primer leads you on to different colors. Now what I'm going to do here is a little bit of dry brush, a little bit of washing. I'm also going to add a detail to it where I do some freehand and I use the micron pen. I do use micron pens when it comes to writing things like letters or ruins. I do that with the pen. Uh, I feel more comfortable that way. You may feel more comfortable with a uh, brush in order to do that. But however you're comfortable with. There is no wrong way to do it. There is no real cheating in order to win. Everything is a tool in your toolbox to be able to get this accomplished. So in order to get this accomplished effectively, use all the tools in your toolbox necessary for the job at hand. Thinking about a carpenter who comes in to lay down a rug, but don't have, doesn't have the staples appropriate for the rug. Are they going to continue to lay down a rug inappropriately? No, they're going to use the tool appropriate for the job to make life easier. Could he nail it down one at a time? Sure. Would it take him all day? Absolutely. Would he rather just finish early and go on to the next job to make even more? Yeah, that's where it's at. Efficiency. So using tools like airbrushes and uh, any kind of ticks and, and trips and T tips and tricks and techniques that you can use in your arsenal, in your toolbox to make you achieve a goal, I say go for it. Don't worry about it and don't worry what other people say. You do you, man or woman. You do you. So, this is an interesting brush that I chose for this because this brush I actually got at the Nova Open. I haven't bought a brush a miniature painting brush in, well, my goodness, I can't, since the early 2000s, when I got the Games Workshop brushes, the blue ones you see there, they no longer make them. After that model, they came out with models that they had like different color tips at the ends. And then after that model, it came out with a different model as well. So this is going way, 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 way back. And the reason why I still have these brushes, because I've always been intimidated by using nice brushes. I've always used bad brushes. And when I say bad, Bad brushes I mean just very very cheap nylon brushes and you know I achieved a certain degree of effect with that but now that I'm using this game changer so much more control you know and it's the reason why is because it just makes it so much more convenient when you have a tip that is really flexible and goes back into place really easily it really allows for control and we have a tip that stays like that it is heaven to paint with now, I do have Winsor & Newton Series 7, uh, I have a 0 and a 1, which I'd love to start using if I ever get brave enough to use it. I'm sticking with GW until they just go kapui, and once they go kapui, I am going to go and use the Series 7s and see how they are. I did buy those Series 7s from an art store, and they charged me 30-something bucks per brush, which is Absolutely outrageous when you can get them for 11 bucks online on Amazon. So don't go to the art store unless you really want to support your local art store. And if so, then buy it at the art store. But if they are going to charge you an astronomical uh, markup for that, then, I mean, your money is better spent other places. Like buying more miniatures. Let's get real, folks. We, we all have that addiction to that plastic crack. <laughs> and that's what it is. I've seen some collections of people with miniatures and scale modelers that are make mine look tiny. And I have a significant amount, I guess, to some people, uh, but make mine look absolutely dwarf in size. And what I mean is really small. 
So, like a dwarf star, which is our sun, really, and not our sun. We do not have a sun together. I'm in the one in the sky, silly. Anywho, let's get back to the miniature. The rocks are coming out really nice. I really like the texture of it. I'm lightly brushing different areas, exhibiting some brush control there. Again, another technique which I use often, uh, which I encourage you to practice as often as possible. Um, and that is, you know, just getting into the muscle memory of small brush strokes you know, and then it's just no wrong or right way to do that. Some people use very long sweeping brush strokes as well, and they come up with a great effect. So find where you're happy with. All right, time to brown things up here. We're going through the airbrush, and we're just coming a different variants of brown. We don't want the same. Now, if you look at the ground, really look at the ground, you're going to see some shadows. You're going to see some browns, some light browns where the light's hitting it as well. And I like to add some color variation to it. I do want to add a little bit of a burnt ground to it. So I try to come in with different kind of um, different types of, of browns onto the floor onto the actual base of the miniature. Okay, time to do some highlights. Here I do just, just a little bit of skull action here, and I kinda wanna just prime it white before I gotta hit it with that bone. I overlooked this skull completely. And if I knew there was a skull there, I would've added a skull in the front, so I didn't even see it. After all the time looking at this miniature and painting up this miniature, I never noticed that there was a skull at the bottom. I thought it was just another rock. Maybe because I didn't want to see if there was a skull at the bottom. Maybe I just wanted to keep going. But oh no, I'm not going to keep going while there's something else to paint on my miniature. No way! That's not, that's not the way we do over here in a miniature's paintbrush. If you want to paint something in the miniature's papers, then you're going to have to paint it completely or not at all. You got to get out of here with that stuff, trying not to paint your miniatures. I don't even know what that's all about. Anywho. So yeah, it's the same process as the teeth as we're going to do for the skull itself. So again, coming up with that base coat, then after the base coat dries, I'm going to hit it with that bone white. Then after the bone white dries, I might hit it with some Agrax Earthshade and Cerebon Sepia. Uh, probably Agrax Earthshade because I want to kind of separate it from the bone that is on the teeth. Or maybe not. It, and you could do it either way. It, it's up to you. You can put Colea Green Shade if you wanted to to simulate a mossy effect. You can go in a lot of different directions. I said it once, but I'll say it several times. The way I paint miniatures isn't the right way. It's just my way, and this is the effect that I get. So, if you want to replicate the effects that I get, then follow me exactly. But if you just want to become your own artist, and you want to do things your way, then use any tips or tricks and techniques that I've shown you here with your own colors. You can change it up. Just go from a darker color to a lighter color, from the shadows to, to the highlight area, and consider where, there's, where the lightest source is coming from and how it's shining on the creature. Now, when I say light source, it could be sunlight, it could be moonlight, with all different kinds of lights. And all different kinds of lights react differently and change the color value of the actual item that you're looking at. If you've ever looked something in the middle of the night with a full moon, it looks a little different than if you looked at something in the bright, bright sunlight day. And that has to do with the light value. The light value reflecting all the colors bouncing back up from wherever you're standing. So if you're standing in a green meadow, that green is actually going to reflect back. And if you're in the middle of the night and it's like a bluish night, then that blue is going to reflect back. So you always have to consider the light source and what type of light it's in. Because that will change the value of the colors of the miniature. Alrighty. More painting and chatting. <laughs> Alright, let's see what we have here. 
There's another skull that I totally missed, and we're going to paint that one up too while we're at it. I try to do a lot of my painting in real time so you can see how long it really does take me as far as that uh, as far as painting is concerned. Now it does take me a lot longer because you know setting up, getting in the mood, stoking myself to paint, uh, getting the correct paints out, uh, also setting up the the wet palette and turning on some either YouTube video or some podcasts and sink into my chair, grab the miniature, grab the brush, make sure I just make the point is, is there and, and the bristles aren't too hard and they're flexible and then I start to paint. And if I have to use airbrush, there's even more steps to that. So those parts I didn't record. Me actually getting to paint is where I record. And, you know, it really didn't take me all that long when it came to paint time, if you consider just the paint time that I used. So this was a speed paint for me. I think it took in all two days to be able to do two little sessions in which I sat down and I got her done. And honestly, I really like the way it looks. I really think it came out really well. I think it's a fun miniature. I think it's fun to play around with. And I think it's intimidating enough that on any table I set it down on, uh, people will kind of freak out and say, oh my goodness, what did I get myself into? What is that? Although it only has a challenge rating of two, so it shouldn't be too bad. Um, to level two fighters, yeah, you, you might wind up with that. All right, time for some bone white on these skulls. Ooh, ooh, bone white on the skulls. Bone white on the skulls. I should not sing. That's terrible. Again, replicating what I did for the bone and the teeth. Time for some bone white on these skulls and kind of make it come alive. And all I do is just push some paint around. Again, different technique than I use with the Dust King. Dust King was zenithal primed and highlighted. And then I added some details to it. And then I glazed over it. The technique that I used here was using an airbrush to build up the values of the shadows and the darkness. And then painting some freehand. And, and go into town with the details. Now, right or wrong, it's just different. That's it. They come out with different effects. I know the Dust King came out super bright and vibrant. I love that. And this one came out super muted. Now, I don't know if that has to do with just the colors that I used, or maybe, you know, how flat it is, and, you know, how more, I don't know. And this, I, don't, I can't really tell you exactly why. Uh, they came out differently. It could be a lot of different factors, not just the manner in which I paint it, but also, you know, the, the other factors as well. Like paint used, and I don't know. I can't tell you with certainty. But there seemed to be something to it. That if you paint in sketch town, maybe it comes out a little brighter. I don't know. I still have to paint a couple of more miniatures in that style just so I can see what it's really, really like and how it reacts to different types of colors. So more about my experimentation with that sketch style kind of painting and more about blending that kind of painting into my arsenal of painting. So this way I may start off with a sketch style, bring it into this kind of style, bring it back to the sketch style and switch back and forth between styles on one miniature. And that's the way you improve. All right, time to do some writing on there. I write run with an exclamation point and a circle I don't know, like a polywag kind of circle. I don't know how else to explain it. But I did brace my hand, as you can see there, limiting my motion in order to write. And this is what you need to do when you're writing. Uh, you need to brace your hand to give you optimal control. You want to always be in control of what your miniature is doing on the table. So in order to do that, you know, in order to have that control while painting, you need to brace your hand, limit your movement, so this way it'd be controlled and it could be precise, just like an instrument.
One thing I did not mention is that I hold all my miniatures on paint bottles, uh, on, the, on those, not paint bottles, on those medicine bottles. And I really, really love using something to hold on to a miniature. You do not want to hold on to your miniature while you're painting it. One, you can increase the chances of wet paint getting smudged or a fingerprint getting onto your paint job. Secondly, you don't want to touch your miniature because there are oils in your hand and as you're painting those oils are going to form a barrier between the paint and the next layer of paint that you decide to add on to it making that second layer of paint not adhere to that area as greatly as you want to and more susceptible to be rubbing off now the last thing you want on your miniature which can be handled by many people is your paint to rub off when somebody touches it so, you seal that baby in with varnish is what you do. Um, so, not touching the miniatures, using this, I use uh, pill bottles with some poster tack on the back, and then I don't have to touch the miniature whatsoever. All right, getting that gradient there, being able to get a gradient uh, is exactly where you want to go. And now I'm going to do this base. Now, I do do black rimmed bases. You can do other color bases, but I do like black. It keeps that stark contrast, uh, and it really frames all the stuff that's inside the world, that carry-on world, uh, inside the actual base. And that's his little world right there. And it separates that world from our world, which is the grown-up world. So this can exist in our world in a small space, in a vacuum, in its own little world, but in occupying our space. And that's what rimming your miniatures do. So, if you do paint miniatures and you're done, you're going to want to put a black rim straight around the base of your base. Again, other colors too, but black really creates a barrier, a line saying, hey, you know what, no. Nothing else exists outside of this little boxed area. And if it does, it's part of your imagination. It does tell a story when you do black room your bases. Because then you're just making a decision as a painter saying, okay, I'm going to close this section off from the rest of the world. And this little miniature is going to live in its own little world in its happy little place or sad little place. That's up to you. But it looks so much better, as you've seen, as I finished painting the rim of the base. It looks so much better than it was uh, before. And that's because and that's because there's a separation. You don't want it like that newspaper in the background on the bottom. I mean, and that wet palette, that kind of joined in the same world as this, uh, this carry-on worm. And now, it doesn't. Now, it's in its own little space, in its own little world. Okay, next we're going to add some tufts to this. And when you add a tuft to your miniature, you want to be careful because uh, some people just add the tuft and then walk away and they're done. But the thing is, most of these tufts are way, way, way too bright just to leave it on its own. So you want to put some shade in there to darken it up, to even up the, the earth tones that are there. Especially because this area is kind of swampy. It doesn't make sense that the grass would be perfectly clean. So I do wash these little tufts. Uh, I think that was one tuft that I broke in half and put it onto the miniature. And then I'm going to put some uh, shade onto these items. These um, WWS, that's the uh, company that makes them uh, little, little tabs or, or I want to say fur. <laughs> I, don't, I shouldn't say fur, but I want to say fur, but little, little grass tabs that you can put onto your miniature. Just remember, it's not once and done. You do want to shade those down just so you can use some kind of paint that you used on the miniature to tie that um, basing material to the rest of the miniature. There's something that unifies them all because everything was touched with that brownish color at some point in time. Therefore, 
it really, really unifies the piece when you take a look at it. And there is some of that brown, even the tuft that you had put down. It's looking great right there. Time to go on to the next phase. All right, time to add some leaf litter. I do like uh, Green Stuff World and their leaf litter. They do have a leaf punch, but I bought this leaf litter because it's never going to end. These are birch seed tree, birch tree seeds, there it is. And they dried it up and it turned into those little things. But I have so many that adding three, four, five, or 10 per miniature, uh, it would last me years upon years upon years to be able to get all that leaf litter in, to be able to use all that leaf litter up. So I'm not even worried about cutting more out and using the hole punch. It is a great idea to have a hole punch for, for leaf litter and then as many things as you possibly can for basing material because then essentially you can make as much as you want. And making as much as you want when it comes to leaf litter is awesome because you can always use it for different kinds of occasions. Although, like I said, these birch tree seeds are actually very, very easy to do. Okay, here I just want to reinforce that black. I don't think the black uh, really was dark enough I hate to say that, but I think some of it rubbed off when I touched it a little prematurely. And that's another thing. When you're rimming your bases, please allow it to dry completely before you spray it with anything. Speaking of spraying it, the only thing I did off camera over here was that I hit it with Tester's Dull Coat, and I do like that as a rattle can to be able to just dull down the miniatures and add that varnish, that protective coat, that protective layer onto the, uh, onto the miniature so this way you can see it wholly and it's protected from all those hands that want to touch it. Well, here it is. Enjoy the pictures. Well, there you have it. A little bit of freehand. I think it's my first ever. And a little bit of uh, graffiti on some rocks and some first for me for this carry-on worm, which was a lot of fun to build. And I can't wait to bring you the next miniature. So if you like this video, like, share, and subscribe. And I'll catch you next time on the Miniatures Paintbrush.